You're listening to the Cricket Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cricket Podcast for another IPL extravaganza. It's Wednesday, so we've got games from Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday to talk about. That means we'll be discussing Mumbai Indians v the Rajasthan Royals, the Royal Challengers Bangalore versus the Lucknow Super Giants, and the Kolkata Knight Riders v the Delhi Capitals. I also, if we've got time, Ross, and this will probably be a task for you, want to just touch upon the Pakistani captaincy crisis because we haven't given that enough airtime on the podcast and um it, it's been playing out a treat i'm jack hope i'm joined by ross how you doing ross uh i'm all right i've got a bit of flu so i've not been too good since uh we last were on the podcast on sunday but um i'm on the road to recovery um unlike delhi yes uh good to hear champ and we've got dan weston how you doing dan no flu with you i hope no flu, just the tiredness part of it after doing seemingly like a lot of work recently. So uh, in terms of tiredness, I'm probably about as uh, active as the Delhi dressing room right now. Okay, fair enough. Um, we're going to get into the cricket in a second, but before we do, a reminder that we need you to subscribe. We're about 150 subscribers short of 16,000 on YouTube. So that's the next target if you're, if you're one of the watchers. You know, click that button, help us out. And um, we don't really have a, a number for audio, but we need more audio subscribers. That's always good. So click that button. And why not leave a review? Ross, what are you going to say? We've got big news, haven't we? We are back with Serious Cricket, Jack. Not only are we sponsored by Manscaped, we're also sponsored by Serious Cricket. So if you're in the UK and you need new cricket gear, Serious Cricket is the place to go. So uh, we've got to have an affiliate link in our show notes. Click on that and you'll go and have a really, really good time um, and get yourself some new cricket stuff. Awesome. Uh, should we do today's game first, boys? Um, I've got a quick summary of it. Cole, 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 they saw, they conquered. It was runs from the Ryan, runs for Raghavanshi. I'm going to think I got that right. We'll see. Uh, who had a great debut. Runs for Dre Russell, runs for Rinku Singh. Ishak Sharma bowled one amazing Yorker, and that was pretty much it for Delhi with the ball in hand. Um, when it came to batting, Risha Punt, he got some runs. That was good to see. Back to back 50s for the first time for him since the 2018 series. And I think it was back-to-back 50s for Tristan Stubbs as well, or or two 50s in a week for him. He batted pretty nicely. Uh, Unfortunately for Delhi, they conceded 272 runs. So (laughs) despite the nice, nice innings from Stubbs and Pant, they still ended up losing by over 100. A huge net run rate swing to Kolkata Knight Riders, who are now three games, three wins, no losses. Uh, A devastating blow to Delhi, who are now four games, one win, three pretty bad hammerings. Well, two pretty bad hammerings and one absolute evisceration. Um, my big takeaway from the game, Dan, we'll come to you with this straight away. Is that I, I think in the in the history of T20 cricket, there's an argument to say that Andre Russell and Sonal Narine are the, the two greatest players of their generation. You know, arguably in the top five, well, Andre Russell might be the top one player we've ever seen in T20 cricket. What I took away from today was that it's amazing to see them in full flight, even as they head towards the twilight of their careers. They they played amazingly, didn't they? Yeah, that, yeah, absolutely. And I think I think we got quite a lot of flack actually for putting Russell in our sort of IPL greatest eleven, didn't we? Before we did, the yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think now Russell now Russell's shutting up the haters a little bit with uh, <laughs> another display of of, of big hitting. And Narayan as well, going for 7.25 economy in, in in his four overs when um when Delhi only by one over spin and then obviously smacking 85 off 39 up front in this like kind of uh, full full redemption loop from about 2018 is like is an incredible performance of him, obviously, as well. So, yeah, the uh, the West Indies duo of uh, KKR probably a lot of people thought that they might be sort of in decline and 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 perhaps falling by the wayside a little bit, but there's not much sign of it yet. Yeah, Ross, um, Andre Russell, Son on the Ryan, who would you take for your all time dream team, T20 cricket? Surely there's space for both of them. <laughs> if it's a dream team, <laughs> I, can, I can take both of them. Right? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a fair um, comment. It's a fair comment. Yeah. No, yeah, okay. Uh, for your park cricket team. <laughs> for my park cricket team. Uh, well, uh, well, surely Dre Russ. Dre Russ would just be hilarious. Like, literally, imagine seeing Dre Russ do that. I think um, it'd be pretty incredible. Um, the only bit I see is like people. Like, Dre Russ could turn up and bowl spin and would still be good. So, who knows? Yeah. Um, Let's look at some numbers here. Son of Orion, 85 off 39, strike rate of 200. Um, Ragu Vanshi, on debut, he was two years old when the IPL kicked off. He, he actually <laughs> literally doesn't remember the first game. Like, that's that's how young this guy is. We're, we're getting pretty close to somebody who wasn't born playing in the IPL. It wasn't born when the IPL started playing in the IPL, to complete that sentence using proper words. Playing strike rate of 200. Dre Russ, strike rate of 215. Rinku Singh, strike rate of 325. Um, Dan, KKR are, are a wagon here, aren't they? I mean, is this... We thought Mumbai would be the batting lineup of the tournament. But KKR pulled this random 18-year-old out of thin air, and he's turned up and <laughs> smashed 54 or 27 here. They, they've got to be the ones to beat at this point, haven't they? Um, I think it's too early to say that. I still think that, that, that for me, Rajasthan, and we'll go on to talk about them uh, uh, later on, they're still the team that I, I think look the, the most complete at the moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, th- this is a fearsome batting lineup. And, and obviously, when you've got Narayan scoring 85 39 and R- Raghavanshi scoring 54 or 27, you've got the luxury of batting Russell at four because his entry point becomes a lot more feasible to come in when you're 164 for two when you're coming in at number four after 12 overs. So, yeah. Um, I, the interesting thing was Ragavanchi in, in Smart in his sort of very young career so far, actually hadn't really done a great deal and, and, and played played for Mumbai. And, uh, yeah, he hadn't really set the world on fire looking at his numbers from, from the recent Smart. He... The best of 32 and a strike rate of 116. So uh, this really is an out of the blue piece of sort of recruitment success, I think, for for, for KKR here. And and, and things have been seem to be working out well. Even even the injury to Jason Roy allowed them to play Phil Salt. That seems to have worked out okay as well. Like him and Narayan getting on them off to some some pretty some pretty rapid starts. Overall, they're looking in good shape. Yeah, Ross, Ragavanchi, I think he was quite good in the under-19s World Cup. I don't want to make this a Ragavanchi show, but he it is nice to have a good debut, isn't it? I mean, we've seen some pretty horrendous debuts from other players, or one other player in particular, who featured in that under-19 World Cup. Um, this guy looked ready, though, I would say, Ross. Yeah, and I think um, it's quite nice when you come in against a team like Delhi, who are absolutely pants, isn't it? And you can kind of sit there and kind of go, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to feast on some of this stuff. And he came in at a point where, I don't know, they were a little bit shell-shocked, really. Um, when when the Ryan is absolutely taking you to the cleaners, like it can it can happen for a little while. But the fact that he's got 85 here is just, <laughs> that, that screams like Delhi just lost the plot, right? Um, and you saw it, their fielding wasn't up to scratch, their bowling. Um, I said on the last podcast, you said, oh, they They've managed to beat CSK. Um, are we going? Are we going to see? Um, are we going to see a renaissance from Delhi? I was like, I don't think so. Um, and immediately in the next game, they've embarrassed themselves. So um, yeah, I think fair play to the youngster, but um, we couldn't have asked for a better opposition to come in against. Well, let's talk about Delhi then, Ross. You brought up the fact that they uh, weren't up to scratch. How bad are they? Um, well, I think in our preview sessions, we said that it's going to be a wooden spoon off between them and RCB. And um, for once, our predictions are looking pretty damn rosy um, because yeah, what you saw here was, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, they, they just almost just got behind something. <laughs> they literally got on a hiding to nothing, really. And yeah, you just saw them lose control of the game very quickly. Um, and sometimes yeah, it's, it's going to be really difficult to recover from there. Um, they obviously were fielding a couple of people they'd probably rather not field, um, and they were missing um, what um, missing Cole Deep. His name. Yeah, Cole Deep's missing, and Rakesh Kumar uh, missing as well from the lineup, and that is a blow to to um, to Delhi. So here, when your best bowler <laughs> Nokia goes for fifty nine, you're a bit of that. Ooh, that's a, that is a problem, um, but again, this the, the makeup of Delhi just doesn't make any sense to me, and they've got ultimately no excuse. They are three cycles in, four cycles into the auction um, position, 
and what they've put together is a pretty abomination of a of a IPL side, if I'm perfectly honest. And I think that they have not addressed the problems that they've got. Um, and KKR actually have done. I'm really impressed by what KKR have done and the whole approach that they're taking. Um, Dan, you kind of said, you know, it's a bit too early to um, say whether KKR are going to be the team to beat in this tournament, but they are playing brilliant T20 cricket. They have got a bit of flexibility about them and they've clearly got a plan around how to take down teams and all they can do is beat what's in front of them. And Delhi, unfortunately, today, um, yeah, we're lucky to escape without the record for highest um, runs conceded. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's definitely true. Uh, we talked a lot, Dan, about squads in our first three or four shows of the tournament. So I'm not going to ask anything about the the auction, but or or, or like you know the players available to them. Addressing you know the here and now with Delhi, the players that were on the pitch, did they do anything good? Or, or did they just make a succession of really, really heinous decisions to compound the fact that they're fielding a weak team? Um, I mean, I texted you, Jack, during the game. And I'll read out the text. I've got it on my phone just, just whilst I was chatting. I, I, I saw it searched on my phone. Imagine your opposition being 126 for one off nine overs with Narine smashing you everywhere. You take a strategic timeout decide out of all of your bowlers it's got to be Mitch Marsh bowling the 10th <laughs> um, that's enough that's enough that's all you need to say I mean <laughs> apart from the fact that this three quarters of this study team look like they've been better three or four years ago and, and, I, and I don't get Marsh full stop like I've never really found him this level boys do you know what he his average and strike rate is in the IPL in his career uh, I'm going to go with an average of 28 and a strike rate of 129. Ross? Uh, I'm going to go less. I'll go 125, your strike rate, an average of 24. Well, you're both pretty accurate with strike at 128. You're both very, very complimentary to Mitch Marsh when it comes to his average. <laughs> <of stuff. laughs> it's it's what? 20, 20 average, 128 strike rate. Might as well play green. Should have kept Manish Pandey, shouldn't they? Yeah. Well, if, you, um, if, you, if you're going to have a player who does that, it might as well be a local, right? Yeah, that's not great. Uh, and he got out to Mitchell Stark for his first wicket of the year, um, mm. which was not good for <laughs> for Mitch Marsh. But it was good for it was good for Mitchell Stark. If there was a, if their KKR had a problem, it was that Mitch Marsh wasn't taking any wickets, and now he's got a couple. So hopefully he's feeling good. It's tough um, as well. Yeah, to to be honest, boys, I don't think there's too much more to say about this match. I think it was a, a little bit, well, it was one-way traffic. We saw a good team absolutely pound a bad team. Ross, is there anything that you think we've missed that we should pick up before we move on to another game? Um, did Delhi bowl 19 overs of pace? Yes. Yes. Why did uh, did I miss it? Or did well, Why did Akshar only bowl one over? I know he got pumped in the first over, but he's still pretty good, Akshar, and he could probably come back from one bad over when he's uh, against the old pain train. Personally, um, I think they're scared to bowl him against Narine, which I kind of understand. Um, but then I do think there was a gap of sort of four or five overs when um, when uh, after Narine was out and Russell got set, that they could have bowled him a bit more. Yeah. I still I think, think I still think Ross to go to just to address that. I, I I still think that Akshay Patel is a better bet, even in a bad matchup, than some of the trash bowling that we did actually see. Mm-hmm. Like well, yeah, Akshay Patel is like, a reliable four over bowler. Go on, Ross. Go on. Yeah. Well, this is a, so. In terms of the management of some of the franchises that we're seeing this year, the wheels have truly come off in some of the areas. And I know that it's easy in T Twenty cricket where you kind of there is high variance involved. So in some places, there's a bit of a coin toss and who's going to win, who's going to turn up, right? And those kind of bits. But some of the decisions that some of these franchises are making, especially Delhi, is really, really poor. And I'm wondering where where does the blame ultimately lie? For that, is it at Ponting's feet or is it at Pant's feet? Where where does it lie? Are we starting hashtag Ponting out? Is that what you're I, you're going I'm, for? I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying, if, if I if this was Premier League football and Dan and I are obviously big Spurs fans, we always mm. talk about actually at what point does the managerial culture of sacking and that kind of stuff actually happen mid season? I think there has to be a question here. Ponting, brilliant commentator, brilliant captain, not a brilliant coach. I don't think. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think if, I think for Premier League, if you had Premier League kind of accountability, media scrutiny and stuff, I do, I do think that it's probably fair to say that his position would be under threat. Although what I would say as a caveat to that is, is that we never really know quite how much impact and decision-making ability a coach or a captain has at a team. I think it's it's really hard and often a mistake to to think that they, yeah, they, they, that they have everything under their control, which is not always the case. Um, so I, I really like that uh, part, Dan. Actually, I, I, yeah, if, I think you're right. Where does the power truly sit? Yeah, absolutely. And but the, but then by, on the flip side, if you're a coach and you've you've taken a job and you know what it's like and you keep working for that team, then actually you probably do deserve that those issues because you've you've made a choice you if you mm. if you know that you don't have the the say in a lot of things and you stay in the job you basically lose the right to complain yeah yeah i think i think that's fair and i, I think i completely take your point there around that point so yeah who, who do we know like before we used to take the piss out of sunrisers um <laughs> but now delhi they're, they're, they're going into the sunrisers old category here so it's danger yeah. zone Right, should we take a quick break and then we'll come back uh, and should we do Mumbai next? Because that's probably the big news. We'll, we'll not do it in, in sync. We'll do it. We'll do a curveball. How about that? Back in a second. Good. You're listening to the Cricket Podcast. Welcome back, everyone, to the Cricket Podcast, where we are going to talk Mumbai Indians v Rajasthan Royals. We've got another game coming up in part three, which will be, well, it will basically be Royal Royal Challengers Bangalore. I keep getting that name wrong. I'll just say RCB from now on. It will basically be RCB being blown away by Mayank Yadav, not to provide too many spoilers. Um, before we do that, make sure that you are subscribed to the Cricket Podcast. And why don't you check us out on one of our other social media platforms at the Cricket Podcast pod or head over to patreon patreon.com forward slash the cricket pod if you want to join our discord and get some bonus content um ross have you got a summary for mumbai v rajasthan you're a rajasthan's fan yep trent bolt turned up mumbai folded rajasthan went out to bat and did it in a very controlled way and it was an easy win um it was if i'm perfectly honest pretty pretty easy um against what should be a pretty formidable mumbai indians team um but there are major, major questions at Mumbai Indians. Whilst things are looking pretty rosy for the Royals, who haven't really got out of kind of uh, third gear. Jice will Butler, neither of them have banged yet. Um, and yet they sit with three wins out of three, whilst Mumbai at the opposite end of the table with three losses from three. So um, it's um, yeah a tale of two fortunes here for yeah, two fr- franchises we favoured to be in the playoffs this year. Yeah, should we get Rajasthan out of the way and give them some compliments and then we'll do a little bit of um, a deep dive on what's gone wrong for Mumbai Indians and whether their season hopes are over, um, which which genuinely could be a thing. You know, they genuinely could be done. Um, Rajasthan, Dan, they're pretty good. And, and as Ross was saying, we've sort of seen them be good without one of their huge strengths absolutely going off here. You'd think that Jaiswal and Butler would be... Mm or, you know, will come good at some point in the tournament. Um, the other strength, probably Bolt and Chahal, is able to bail them out on this occasion. And it, it does look like they are quite a complete team as a result of that, doesn't it? Well, it does, for, I think, for a few reasons. First of all, I think they've got their role clarity pretty much nailed. Um, they actually seem to know what they're doing with their bowlers. And and, and as we talked about on the other, our other podcast, Strike Rate, the Cricket Analytics podcast on Monday about Chennai Super Kings, we spoke about you know them putting their players in positions where they can exhibit their super strengths, and I think RR are doing that that pretty effectively at the moment as well. Um, I think they've got they've got extremely good good role clarity. They've got a good cartel of domestic bowlers, and have got I think some good backup bowlers as well. Um, and from the domestic market, uh, and yeah, as as Nav- Navni talks about in the chat, they they do I think have one of the best and most complete units in in the IPL right now, and in terms of bowling, 
and and what they've done is prioritize domestic bowlers what they've done is that even if they're not playing them they are making it harder for the other teams to find good domestic bowlers and i think we're, we're seeing that game in game out at the moment there's just not enough good domestic bowlers to go around so no i really like what rajasthan are doing i think that after sort of few teething issues um, with a sort of management around that sort of 22 mega auction in terms of the recruitment i think that they've actually they've been the, the team now for me over the last year or so the last couple of ipls probably that look like they actually know what they're doing and and, yeah. and, and while that shouldn't be a high bar in in, in the ipl it actually yeah it's, i'm sorry it should it, that should be a given for most teams right but it's not at all and we're just seeing this right now with with Mumbai, we're seeing it with Delhi and a few other teams as well. Right, so that's all the good things about Rajasthan done. Ross, uh, Mumbai, they did they did quite a few things wrong in this game. Um, it started before the toss when the home fans booed Hardik Panja um, and had to be told to behave themselves, which was absolutely hilarious. Uh, then about six balls into their innings, they found themselves two wickets down. Um, their number three had just got out for a golden duck, so they super subbed him out for another batter who then got out for a golden duck. Um, <laughs> things didn't really improve. They sent in Piers Trawler above Tim David, which was um, one of the more interesting batting lineups you'll see, uh, I think, in this entire IPL. And then by the time Tim David got to bat, he'd run out of partners and so ended up sort of knocking the ball around, going nowhere for a while. Um, and stranding well-known all-rounder Jasper Brimra at the other end uh, as he refused singles, much to the chagrin of Brian Lara, who was determined that, that <laughs> absolutely determined that Jasper Brimra would be better off facing than Tim David at one point. Um, I mean, like ironically, Brian Lara was right. Like Tim David got out the very next ball, but um, it was. It was. There were a litany of failures. Where do you want to start with Mumbai Indians? Because you could go in one of many directions there. Um, well, maybe we should take, take a wider view. Maybe it's not just not this game. I think this game is just it completely just shows what's gone wrong for Mumbai throughout this tournament thus far. Um, I think we've got the Hardik versus Rohit bit. We said before the tournament that is there going to be a split in the camp, right? And we thought that actually people could just be professional. They're both grown men they're both being paid to play cricket and it doesn't really matter who's captain really at the end of the day right just get on play cricket and enjoy the spectacle but every single fan like why is he being booed i don't understand why he's being booed like there is not a like, for, for me pandia hasn't decided you know what i'm gonna go and do this and i'm gonna screw over rohit right he's been traded for probably the best trade ever in sports history to mumbai indians um, and then Mumbai Indians have just been just like, yeah, you can have a go at our number one asset. Um, and yeah, we've got this guy who was, let's be fair, Rohit Sharma, declining as a T20 um, player um, and putting in succession planning so that they can then retain him in the next auction. And it's going to be a mega auction, right? So there'll be some interesting retention rules around that that no doubt we can talk about at a later date. Um, I think Mumbai have done the right thing with the Hardik piece. I just don't get why there's so much drama around it all. Uh, I think it's a good question. I, mean, I, I think there's, there's, I, I think because Rohit has won tournaments and because Rohit has played for Mumbai for a long time and because Rohit is India captain, there is a slight diification of Rohit. There's also, historically, there's a, a Rohit v Kohli thing, isn't there, in, in Indian cricket more generally. And so there's quite a lot of people that have got quite a lot of ego tied up in Rohit Sharma, is, is my call on this. And, um, that's that's you know you get different to cricket cultures around the world don't you where where the mm. captain is more or less important and I, I think I think India is probably on one of the extremes there where the, where the captain is you know extremely important and for us, some other teams they seem to change the captain every two minutes and it doesn't really matter at all I mean like everybody in West Indies and I don't mean just the players. It feels like everyone in the West Indies has had a go as West Indies captain. And like, yeah, varying degrees of success for sure. But it doesn't seem to really, really offend people if they're not the captain anymore. Um, quite a lot of people just resign, so don't want to do it. Uh, so I, I, I think I think there's probably a, a, a cultural element to it. I mean, like what is what's interesting, and, and I would come to you on on this, Dan, I, I think, is like whether this is actually having an effect on the team. Is this one of the reasons that we can point to for why Mumbai Indians are 
the basement dwellers of this year's IPL. I, I can't think for one minute that it's helped because there's you know there's there's probably one sort of internal rumblings about about it. Two, we we know we've seen this sort of the reaction of, of supporters and. And those can't be positives, you know. It's, it's, it's really difficult to create a good culture in a short space of time in these in the in these uh, T20 tournaments. Even even for a league, the IPL is perhaps a little bit more. You're with the players for a little bit longer. It is re it is really really tricky. Um, and and I I just think that Rohit hadn't done anything wrong, basically, as captain. I can understand succession planning. And I think the other key point is, is that I think there's a perception that this captaincy was removed from, from Rohit, whereas, for example, at CSK, with with Dhoni, Dhoni not being captain anymore and Gaikwad being captain, that there's that different perception that Dhoni has voluntarily made that decision. And I think that you talk about the deification of, of players, and I think that's a critical difference there but is it, is it the only reason the that mumbai have struggled no it's not no way there's there's there's, ma there's many other reasons um look a suit I, I said it so many times and i and i've and I, i've said it on, on blue in the face and i'll keep saying it the moment that they paid all that money for ishan kishan and the mega auction completely ruined them as a team because they meant that they couldn't spend any half decent money on bowlers and then they put the one big money bowler that they did buy was injured and couldn't play. And they knew that, <laughs> that before, the, before the auction, they knew he was injured and wouldn't be able to play. They still bought him. So go figure. Um, then you've got the, the, then you've got the, a think tank that thinks that Pius Chawla can go and do what R. Ashwin did in this, in, in for, for starting like pinch block or whatever on earth that was supposed to be. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, someone there must really not like Tim David against spin. <laughs> I mean, we saw that we would have seen Telek Varma farm the strike against Tim David when the spinner was on, and uh, it's embarrassing, isn't the, it? It is embarrassing. I must think he's just dreadful against it. Um, and, you know and, and, and also, like the final point is I'm trying to make is that you know you've got like you know the fair play table. I've never really understood what the fair play table was or represented, or how a team would benefit from that when it comes up on the TV. But I think there must be like in, in in Mumbai's head, there must be this like sort of table that no one else sees, and it's like the we want to create a superstar league table when they pick guys like Namandir and Dwar Brevis and, and and Mafaka. Like this is a year before a mega auction. Just, just buy a win now team, honestly. Like you don't get bonus points for developing future superstars. Yeah. Well, on, the, on that point. Oh, go on, go on, Ross. You've been waiting. I was, I was gonna, I was gonna say that, right? Well, uh, what? Like, don't get me wrong. Mafaka like, looks like he's gonna be a good player, but he's not even out of school. There's no reason to be playing him, right? He's, he's not sitting there going and bowling. He's not like Mayan Gadav. He's not bowling 96 miles an hour, and he's gonna be like, oh my god, no one else in our team can do this. They've literally got Luke Wood. <laughs> like, if they really want to play an overseas bowler, just, just play. Up. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, yeah. Well, Tashara, even if yeah. yeah, we're not sure. Wood might be injured, but Tashara is on the bench, and and yeah, yeah. I, the, you can you can probably say what you're saying there for Devil Brevis. Will be he's a little bit older. Like the guy hasn't actually really crushed in any of the leagues he's played in yet. He's been decent, but he ha he hasn't absolutely crushed. Um, you could play Mohammed Nabi, and then you've got another spinner. And I'm, I'm not say sitting here saying that Mohammed Nabi is the answer to all Mumbai's problems, but he's he's a proven at the level player you don't need to really you don't really need a number three if you're if you're mumbai indians you've got you've got batting um just slot nabby in below tim david or slot, slot Nab nabby in above tim david instead of pierce Shawler if you really want to like it, it doesn't matter which round they which way around they bat you've got answers to these problems and I, I think it is it is kind of odd that you would select yourself into a situation where you have a 17 year old who I mean, like comparing to Mayank Yadav, Ross, he's four years younger than Mayank Yadav, and and Mayank Yadav looks young and, and is young. Um, he's four years well, younger. He was he was only one when the IPL started. You, you just create a problem <laughs> for yourself, don't you? Like it's a, it's a it's a it's a major problem that you've got two unproven players that that you know barely any experience playing in India. 
batting for and opening the bowling for you. Like that's no other team's doing this. <laughs> no, no, no I, I agree. And the, yeah, and I think miss, they, they miss Sky, right? Shurakumar Yadav. They are yes. clearly miss, missing him, right? You're going to miss the best T20 batsman in the world, but there is no excuse for what they're doing with this lineup. Is my view. Um, Every team gets injuries. Injuries are no excuse. It's as simple as that. Like you, one player's injured. One player's injured. That is not good enough in terms of saying that that's the reason why our season has failed. They've got, they've got five or six really good players. And then they've got, like, I mean, that's like, they're a worse version of what Real Madrid were back in, like, a while back with the Galacticos in football. <laughs> like, they've got, like, it's like Real Madrid, like, oh, we had, like, Zidane and Beckham and uh, Ronaldo and all these forwards and midfielders. And they're like, I oh, will just stick four 17-year-olds in defence and see how that works out. <laughs> And and, and 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 it's like that, but worse, but with Mumbai right now. I, I I just don't understand it. And and I, I, on a side note, I don't like kind of inequality in cricket teams in terms of salaries as well. So like, you know, if you've got a team and like seven guys are like above ten crore, and then the rest of the team and squad on like fifty lark, that's I don't think that's a harmonious setup basically mm. in terms of the squad structure. Yeah, it's difficult. Um, it's certainly difficult. Roth, can they qualify? Um, it is Mumbai, so never say never. But they, knew, they do need to get their head screwed on. It's almost like, um, you know, when you used to play PlayStation as a kid and you'd be like, you started losing to your little brother. And then you'd be like, oh, right, I should, I should start playing properly now. Um, and that's kind of what Mumbai have been doing. They've been kind of been joking around. They've been trying f- tricks and flicks and Hardik Pandya's new haircut and whatever else. Um, but now they need to go, right, let's pick our best 11. Let's bat them in the positions that you need to bat in. Let's try and use the impact sub rule a little bit better because I'm not sure they're utilising that as best as they possibly could be at this point in time. Um, and actually start to be like, no, we are Mumbai Indians. We've won this five, six times. We kind of know what we're doing here. Um, what is likely to happen um, is a bit of drama and um, Rohit being put in as captain. Who knows in this IPL? Um, but yeah, that. Uh, I can never ever write off Mumbai, just like I can never write off Chennai Super Kings. But they need to really change what they're doing from a management perspective. I think if you made an assumption that they were the best team in the tournament, and I think that would be quite a bold assumption to make, bearing in mind the amount of games that are ultimately they're not a literal coin flop here, coin flip, flop, coin flip. They're like a metaphorical coin flip, like they just turn out to be fifty fifties because the teams are actually reasonably close in quality. I think their chances of qualification would be only about 35%. And that's assuming that they are the best team in the tournament, which is probably not true based on what we've seen. Dan, what were your thoughts? Well, look, they're going to have to go 8-3 at least to qualify. And Mm. that's taking a net run rate into account, which is currently minus 1.4, so it's not pretty either. Uh, And there's scope for them to need to go 9-2 to guarantee qualification in their last 11 games. Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> they've, got, they've got they've got more holes in their team than a sieve. They've got a bowling attack made of made up of the greatest bowler in the world and not a great deal else. A player with high upside in Kurt Sayer, but but not, not necessarily proven at this level. And, and not a lot else. That is a big, big, big ask. I don't mm. think I want to quite 100% rule them out, but I'm getting there very quickly. Well, I, then I it's, think... the, it's their next game, right? It's their next game. Yeah. Every If they pretty much turned every game into a cup final, to use a football analogy. If you analogy. ask a percentage chance of them qualifying, if you're at 1% or 2%. <laughs> yeah. Their next game is against Delhi. That's on Sunday. Oh, that's, so, I, mean, yeah. that, I mean, they should win that. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, right. We're going to take um... big trouble. I mean, like, and how many games as well does it take? How many games will they have to lose in a row from here, where they're not three at the moment, for there to be real focus on a captaincy change? Mm, one, I think. Um, we're going to take a break, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about Mike Yadav. You're listening to the Cricket Podcast.
Welcome back, everyone, to the Cricket Podcast, where we will be talking about Royal Challengers Bangalore versus Lucknow Supergiants. Uh, before we do that, just a reminder that we are sponsored by Manscaped, the best in below the work- waist grooming. Um, you can head over to manscaped.com and use the code CricketPod for 20% off plus free shipping. Um, that's an extremely good deal. You can you can like check that out by going to the show notes if you want. And if you can't be bothered to type and uh, clicking the link, the code again is cricket pod and that will get you 20% off plus free shipping. Um, in the game between RCB and Lucknow, Lucknow batted first and um, they got up to 181. It was, it was kind of a little bit of a, a piecemeal innings. We saw Quinton de Kock do his thing, kind of anchored the innings, 81 off 56 for him decent knock then we saw Puran go ballistic and score 40 of 21 and and there wasn't an awful lot else in, in this innings um 181 at the Chinnaswamy most people thought at half time that RCB had done pretty well there that they'd they'd kept like now more or less under control um and the you know the the spin attack of Glenn Maxwell and Glenn Maxwell had done its job in a way to to kind of pull this Lucknow Supergiants team under control. Um, then things got interesting. Lucknow opened the bowling with five consecutive overs of spin, or four four consecutive overs of spin, then an over a pace, then an over a spin. It was something like that. It was five out of six overs were spin. It tied down Virat Kohli, who got out. Faf de Plessis ran himself out under pressure. Um, and there was a wobble. Enter Mayank Yadav who bowled some of the gassiest gas you will ever see, bumping out Glenn Maxwell, you know, bowling Cameron Green with one of the nuts of the tournament, like just an absolute seed at 157 kilometers an hour, clipping the off bail. Uh, and RCB were rocked. They never really got back into the, the, the contest. Anuj Rabat, 11 off 21, kind of typifying the RCB effort, really. Bowled out for 153, doesn't look too good for the Royal Challengers Bengaluru. Um, tell you it does look good for though, Ross, Mayank Yadav. Do you know he's now bowled the most balls in the history of the IPL over 155 kilometers an hour in eight? <laughs> oh, he's bowled eight overs. That's get that is gas. That's I mean, rapid. That is cool. That is look and fast bowling in in cricket is the sexiest thing, right? So that is that's the that's the point. He's now sexiest man on the cricketing planet, um, and it has solved what was going to be quite a big problem for Luck. Now we said in the uh, previews that um, their team is okay. They've got a, so in some in some cases they've got some really good players, but they're going to have to bang as much as possible. And them losing Mark Wood and kind of uh, their bowling, especially in the pace department, really not that up to standard of where it needs to be to be challenging to be a kind of potential playoff contender. Um, and Mayan Yadav has turned that on its head. He is turned up on the scene. Um, people haven't seen him bowl before. Um, they don't know what they don't know about him. And that makes him really, really exciting. But people are, people are scared of him, right? Um, but will this last? We had Umran Malik before he came in. Um, not a flash in the pan. I still think Umran Malik's a good player. But you know, people kind of worked him out a little bit in terms of how to play him. Um, so Mike Yadav here... It's going to be interesting to see how it goes over the next kind of couple of games, um, and also if he can stay fit in that regard as well. Um, but from what we've seen so far, really exciting. And that ball to Cam Green. Cam Green looked like a park cricketer. There, he, he literally was absolutely nowhere near it. Um, and for someone who RCB traded in um, for all of that dosh, you were just like, wow, um, that was a it was a monumental moment. I mean, Cam Green is actually a pretty good player of pace. If you have a look at his stats across all different formats, he's he's not troubled by quick bowling. But as you say, Ross, like he was he was miles away from it. His feet didn't move. He played down the wrong line. He he literally he was just guessing. It was a it was a complete guess from Cameron Green that that ball was going to be where he put his bat, and it and it wasn't. And it flicked the off bail. It was a a really really beautiful piece of bowling. I mean, like you say, we don't we've seen eight overs of this, and and there's a lot of calls on the internet from people saying this guy should be going to the World Cup. He's going to win India, the Border Gavaska Trophy. And and that might happen. But I, I think, like, you know, we're fans of English football here. 
And one of the things you learn if you're a fan of English football is to to pump the brakes on the hype when the next 17-year-old or 21-year-old or whatever it is comes through and just give them a little bit of space to actually see what they can do. Like like, like you say, Ross, we don't know if he can bowl 157 kilometres an hour every game. Like he, he's bowled eight overs in the IPL. We don't know how quick he'll be next week. We don't know what batters will be like when they you know, learn some of his tendencies. At the moment, everyone is going out there and, and they're just guessing at where the ball's going to go. But you know, most bowlers do have tendencies. Now, a good thing for him is that his accuracy seems to be, you know, pretty much as good as his pace. Like he's got great control of length and line and um, doesn't seem like he's the sort of bowler that will spray it. But again, we've seen eight overs. He might have just bowled eight good overs. Um, we also don't know what will happen when he gets hit. It's T20 cricket. Even at that speed, at some point you're going to get hit and and we'll have to see how he reacts to that. But I tell you what, Dan, for... For an initial eight over entry into the, the IPL, he's got two man of the matches now. Like I said, the most balls bowled over 155 kph ever in IPL history. He's been touching 97 miles an hour. Brett Lee was on the TV saying he thinks he can bowl five kilometers an hour faster, which would be like 101 miles an hour or something like that. Um, it is it is super exciting to see this, and and it, it, it you you've got to be kind of pumped now when you watch Lucknow Super Giants, knowing that this whirlwind of speed is is going to be on show it was the thing i was most looking forward to this game in advance of this game was to watch what to watch and bowl again is i wanted to see if it was replicatable and it clearly is replicatable um now interestingly as well you talked about the sort of most balls bowled over 150 kph in two matches <laughs> he's and and, and I, I really value the the this what that's with the work that's done by him and Ish Ganju on Twitter, who's a great follow. And he talks about the runs added uh, over replacement for for players in the IPL this year. And he's second on the list of bowlers after two games. Yeah. Which is like in terms of the overall runs. That's not runs per match, that's not runs per ball, that's runs full stop after two games. Um, yeah, he's gas. Incredible. Yeah, he's I'm, coming I'm, up against Gujarat Titans next, and I think that is a that is going to be a, a, a nice position to be in. And what I loved about Lucknow was they they mixed it up. Like I, th- I think we can get really caught up in the Mike Gadab show, but what we need to appreciate is actually Lucknow's use of their bowlers. Jackie talked about they, they opened up with spin. They literally completely outgamed RCB. And then they were just like, no, this is how we're going to go and win this game. I thought this was one of the most complete performances I've seen actually from a franchise team in quite a long time. Um, and I thought that Lucknow, if they are going to continue down this vein, are going to be quite a, quite a handy team. And I really, really hope he stays fit because it's really fucking exciting. Yeah. I mean, well, we, were, we weren't overly optimistic about Lucknow. I don't think we thought they were a bad team, but we weren't raving about them before the tournament. But now, you know, we've seen Puran get 40 off 20 balls twice in a row. Uh, Bishnoi seems to be near his best. They're, they're two really good players. Quinton de Kock seems to be in, in pretty good form. Left-hander, opening the batting, wicket-keeping. That's a, a nice combination. Although I'm not sure he actually did wicket in this match. Um, and then you throw in Mayank Yadav. It, it, does, it does look like a well-rounded team. I mean, Dan... After the first match, I think we were pretty low in our expectations for Lucknow season. Would, would you have them as a, a serious playoff contender at this point, or do you want another look? Um, I want I want to kind of refine my opinion a little bit over the next few games. Let's see. Um, I think that, that ultimately they've got a good a good team, and they're one of those play, sort of teams who could come fourth, they could come fifth, they could come sixth. We didn't obviously factor in pre-tournament the, the the impact that the man yeah would have and obviously when when someone comes to the four that's one of the greatest things in the IPL is that you, these players come out of nowhere mm. and, and suddenly um and we see it with Raghavanshu as well you know there's plenty of examples they come out of nowhere and they just get you excited to watch watch the tournament and watch the matches and and yeah they, they look a lot better with him in their team that's for sure <laughs> Um, he puts bums um, on seats, right? Is it that kind of player? Uh, yeah. And what I also liked about them, and I guess we're going to have to talk about RCB a bit mm-hmm. at some point, is that is that they opened with two left arm orthodox spinners against Faf and Coley, and I've been screaming out for this for so long. That's like the matchup. It really, really is. 
uh, and, and and they were obviously rewarded with with getting getting Coley from Siddharth. Yeah, uh, RCB pretty briefly because we are running out of time a little bit. Ross, um, it was, was another pretty mediocre performance from RCB. Although they they bowl, I let's say they bowl quite well, but with the bat, it was mediocre, wasn't it? Yeah, and the, the fact that Glenn Maxwell isn't firing is a big issue for them. Um, I don't think they've given themselves enough option. Um, this is one of the teams that ultimately suffers by having an overseas captain, um, I think, in this space, um, because, again, they limit their options with the ball. Um, they could obviously have Will Jacks in that space, um, but this remains to be seen. Cameron Green hasn't had the impact that people thought he would. Um, in this case, he only bowled two overs um, to luck now. Um, and if you're going to spend all of that money and have all of that, all your kind of eggs in that basket, you need to be getting more out of that investment. Um, Reese Topley, obviously coming in, um, offers so much with the bat with his three from six, um, but his um, kind of bowling up front is quite handy for them. But I just think they've, I'm looking at the team, and it just doesn't fill me with any confidence that they are a good T20 franchise. No, the 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 yeah. the, 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 the absolute just dereliction of duty around pulling this team together is a real real worry. Um, and they've got Andy Flower at the helm now, and he's kind of a bit of a magician, right, with um, limited overs teams. But there's no way he's going to put a rap, pull a rabbit out of the hat with this this team. They haven't got the spin bowling. Um, they haven't really just got a plan. It kind of looks as if they kind of go into the game going, fair will score us some runs. He doesn't score them quick enough, puts more pressure on the team. And then actually their middle, middle order, like, it's going to fire every now and again. But you can't rely on Rawat, Dinesh Kartik to continuously kind of try and bail them out because they're just not going to be good enough to do that. So I think if you're an RCB fan, um, our prediction well, of 10th position this year is, yeah, I think that's going to come pretty soon into focus for them um, alongside Delhi. Right. We're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back. We've got a little bit of Pakistan action, a couple of super chats and uh, a couple of minutes previewing the next couple of matches. You're listening to the Cricket Podcast. Welcome back, everyone, to the Cricket Podcast for the fourth and final part of this Wednesday show. Let's start with some Super Chats. Uh, we had a couple in. Thank you very much to Andy. Andy says, who are the best bowlers in T20s right now outside of Boomer? Does Dan still think that Adam Milne can be a success in the IPL and what makes Milne special? So, Dan, in a few words, who are the best T20 bowlers and why isn't Adam Milne at the IPL? Okay, so I'll, I'll take the Milne question first. Um, look, I've worked with Adam Milne for, for quite a long time. Um, I think he's an absolutely exceptional pace bowler. I think the thing that I like about him is he can bowl in all phases. He he has high pace, but uses it very, very well. I think he's got tools. Such, I think all pace bowlers need tools. Like You can't just bowl... Back of a length, back of a length, back of a length. You've got to bowl. You've got to. You've got to have a really devastating short ball or an unbelievable Yorker. You have to have that. He's he's got the tools, and he's also got good. Like I feel like he's got a, 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 enough tools to keep batters guessing on a consistent basis. You don't know if he's going to try and break your hand or take your head off, basically. <laughs> but but as and as but as a human being as well, I think he's you know exceptional guy. Very very. We're very humble, and I, I, I get well with him. And I think that if a fully fit Adam Milne, I, I, I maintain this, I keep saying it, fully fit Adam Milne would be like up there. If, if he if he had had no injuries in the last 10 years, he'd have been paid so much money in the IPL. I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. Um, and Andy also asks, who are the best death bowlers in T20s outside Boomer? I've got a bit of a short list here. Saw the question come in. I had a look. I sort of made up a short list. Um, I really, really like in terms of like a two power play, two death bowler. I really like Faruqi, but he basically has no chance of playing at Sunrisers due to sort of overseas combos. I suppose you'd say. Um, um, I also, I also think that Nassim Shah's got massive potential. Obviously, we've just picked him up in 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 uh, hundred. 
Although, like, I mean, he's unbelievable power play bowler as well, but that's probably in his main area of strength. But I think he's going to be an excellent death bowler as well. I think Pathrana, has, has, in his kind of limited exposure, has shown that, that he's definitely a miles above average death bowler as well. And then the other one I really like is not getting game time in the IPL right now. Uh, but I mean, you look at the bowling attack of some teams and you think, how on earth? Some of these players not get game time in the IPL. Nathan Ellis, like he is a death over machine. <laughs> I really rate the guy too. Right, Ross Jitter asks, "What's up, guys? Another summer of the IPL. What could be better?" I guess the obvious question is, now that they look amazing, how are the Royals going to fuck it up? I'm looking at you, <laughs> Ross. That's what Jitter says. How how are the Royals going to not qualify or not win the IPL? <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to back them. I mean, I'm a Spurs fan and I'm a Radistone Royals fan, so that means I like pain and suffering, pretty much. Um, and it's the hope that ultimately kills you. Um, but this Radistone Royals team, I think we, we said at the start of the show, um, they are well-rounded. They've got clear game plans for each of the opposition that um, they come up against. They've got clear role definition around it. And but all of their superstars aren't even banging yet. So <laughs> there's so much ceiling, I think, in this team. Um, and I think that their variations that they've got is really, really useful. Um, I mean, I was bemused when they picked up Rothman Powell for all that money in the mini auction. I didn't think it solved a problem that they kind of had in that space. But the way in which they're using the impact sub rule actually has made things a little bit more interesting. Um, and we haven't seen them put under loads and loads of pressure yet. Um, and that's kind of given them the freedom to kind of flex um, what they've needed to do. Um, so I think it's that part of how are they going to respond to when a team does take a few early quick wickets or does hit put up a big score and can they go and chase it down or kind of defend it? Um, and that's where I think over the next couple of games, I mean, um, who have they got next in their lineup? So they play RCB next. I mean, that is a huge, huge game. But if you think around kind of having Ashwin, having Chahal, they've got eight overs of decent spin to go against that lineup. And they've got the pace of Bolton Burger, um a Bolton Burger up front. I think they've got enough about them to take that down, but they could be on the receiving end of something a little bit um painful. So my view, they're there to stay. Cool. Let's take a really quick diversion because there are a couple of other things going on in cricket. I just wanted to give a shout out uh, to the Bangladesh v Sri Lanka series for providing some amazing content. Um over the last two weeks, we've seen all sorts of shenanigans with celebrations. Uh, we saw three Bangladeshi players drop one ball. We saw Lytton Das come charging down the wicket with a 465 run deficit and get a golden duck skying a pace of miles up in the air. Um, and yeah, it's amazing. I have, I have no idea why he did that. Absolutely no idea why he did that. And we've seen the emergence of uh, Kamindu Mendis, who now averages 107 with the bat and 10 with the ball. Not that much time to talk about the series, but it's great. Something that we have a little bit of time to talk about, Ross, is the Pakistani captaincy crisis. Um, they have sensationally sacked Shaheen Afridi uh, from the role, replaced him with Babar Azam. Um, also released some fake quotes by Shahina Freedy. It's been another masterclass from Pakistan, who, let's remember, remember appointed Shahina Freedy as the white ball captain, then took the tweet down and 15 minutes relate later announced him as just the T20 only captain in the first place. Um, Ross, can you explain like what's going on in Pakistan? Um, it's just another day in Pakistan. Um, I think that's the <laughs> in Pakistani cricket. It is just absolutely brilliant. And I, if you, what I would love to see is a graphic on the kind of the timeline of changes in captaincy and man, uh, managers and kind of coaching staff, etc., over the last decade, because it has been an absolute bonanza. Um, and what you see here is again the I don't know the power struggle, I suppose. Like we I talked earlier around the Mumbai Indians team and they're kind of being potential cliques within kind of that unit around Rohit, Hardik, etc. Pakistan cricket is on a whole nother level. Um, and what I really liked was um Shaheen being kind of yeah, removed after what I think he's done five games of captaincy or something yeah, quite it's, limited. I think it was five. <laughs> um and like last season the in the um PSL his team did really well with him being the captain. This year they've done really badly and just kind of the flux in what goes on in that team is just incredible. Um and yeah his comment afterwards going pretty well going, yeah do you know what it sucks that I've been removed as a Pakistan captain. Mohammed Rizwan should have been actually given the captaincy. Um and then it comes out another one that he goes, do you know what me and Baba get on really well. All the best for Baba 
and I'll continue giving my 100% support um, to the team. Um, it's better than what you write for Coronation Street or Emmerdale. The, the, it is so good, um, this stuff, that you know, I, I can't get enough of it. Especially as it turned out, I mean, the second quote, I will always cherish the memories and the opportunity. As a team player, it is my duty to back our captain, Babarazm. I played under his captaincy of nothing but respect for him. I will try to help him out on and off the field. We are all one. Our aim is the same, to help Pakistan become the best team in the world. Apparently, he didn't ever actually say that. Pakistan, the PCB <laughs> just said that he said that to, you know, fill in a quote section <laughs> on, a, on a press release, I guess. I mean, like, what, what happens there? Is anyone's guess. Um, I think they play a T20 series against like the New Zealand seaside uh, mm. while the IPL's going on. Like New Zealand aren't sending anyone, let alone the people you in the heard that. I thought you said the New Zealand seaside. I was like, what is that, like beach cricket or something? <laughs> <laughs> it might as well be, yeah. So look, that's all going on. Right, we're going to go back to the IPL um, after that little diversion. We've got two games to preview and we've got less than five minutes to do it. So uh, we'll have some words from one of you each. Um, Ross, tomorrow it's Gujarat Titans v the Punjab Kings. Who's going to win and why? Um, well, I think this is quite a nice game and because you've got the lottery of um, the IPL's version of Pakistan, is, which is Punjab Kings, um, and you never know what's actually going to turn up in that space and who's going to actually perform. Um, but I think they've been doing pretty well. They've been playing pretty decent cricket, making pretty good decisions. Um, obviously, last time out, they had a bit of, um, bit of struggle, but I think ultimately they are not playing bad cricket. Um, Gujarat Titans, on the other hand, are quite clinical. They know how to win. Um, and again, I think they're one of those teams that have good role definition, um, and yeah, ultimately, they yeah they they managed to get ones over on teams that they probably should beat. And I think in the, on this occasion, they probably should beat Punjab. So um, yeah, I think a good rap win is likely. But Punjab Kings are very very exciting, and if there is a team to watch in the IPL, it's typically them. So you can't rule them out. Yep, yeah, uh, and Dan, Sunrisers Hyderabad feature Night Super Kings is on Friday and we'll be doing a show after that, so put that in your diaries. Make sure you're subscribed. Who is going to win and why? Sunrisers v Chennai. Okay, first of all, Gujarat, I, um, I think we'll beat Punjab. The team with great spinners against the team who can't play spin. Uh, <laughs> good luck with that. Um, um, Sunrisers against Chennai Super Kings. I mean, I mean, that's actually going to be a cracking game. Um I think with with sunrises, it's, it's extremely difficult to predict what's going to happen with them. Like they've got a batting lineup that I think most teams would probably envy, but like they just don't seem to really be able to put it all together. As uh, even like a forty over performance, basically twenty with a bat, twenty with ball. CSK uh, notorious for for playing with a, above the sum of their parts. We talked about why they did that on Strike Rate, the Critic Analytics podcast this week. And uh, I think this is a genuine 50-50 game, though. Okay. So Dan's sitting on the fence. Roth, you're going to have to make a call on that one as well. Um, I think CSK need to bounce back. After the um, the Dhoni experience in the last game, I think CSK will want to put um, a wrong right on that front. And I think that they need to beat teams like Sunrisers in this space because... Yeah, they are the team of low variance, whereas Sunrise is the team of high variance. And um, mm. the issue they've got is that I'm not sure they've quite figured out their best 11 yet, um, CSK. And I think actually you've seen some other teams mix and match and CSK are trying to keep that kind of core together. Um, I think they need to start thinking around some a little bit better matchups and a little bit better of how they're going to play. Um, and they've also got to try and nullify the threat of Heinrich Klaassen. Um, so if they figure that out, um, other teams will be very interested. But um, <laughs> the Klaassen factor is really, really exciting so far. Um, and Travis Head, since he's coming into this side, has been brilliant as well. So, um, yeah, I'm going to say that CSK... W need to make a couple of personnel changes to win this game, and if they do, they will. Um, but if some, if they don't, I think some risers will get the better of them on this on this occasion. Um, someone, Andy, has pointed out in the chat that Mr. Fazur will not be available for this game because he's had to go back to Bangladesh to sort out his US visa for the World Cup. So that will be a little so change. Um, it's, it's not that far of a trip, is it, from Bangladesh to? I don't know how long it takes to get a visa. Like US, US. Um, customs can be a real pain. Like he maybe he's in a queue. <laughs> anyway, look, um, not customs, is it? It's if home office, whatever they are, Department Wonderful. for Homeland Security. That's what they're called. Um, we're going to wrap up the podcast there. We'll be back on Friday. Thanks very much for listening. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you find us on other social media at the Cricket Pod. Uh, we have been sponsored by Serious Cricket. You can head to the show notes if you want a link to their site. 
Um, and if you want 20% off your Manscaped product, use the code Cricket Plod. Plod. Cricket Plod? Cricket Pod. Cricket Plod is a, a policeman who plays cricket. Uh, the umpire, <laughs> Cricket Plod. Um, 20% off plus free shipping. Code Cricket Pod at Manscaped.com. Thanks very much, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>